Good morning, my name is Melissa Pillman. I am an elder at Monsieur de Wrigleyville and I'm so glad you all are here joining us on our first adventure of doing our sermons on live stream on YouTube. After the service, you will see a link down below to join us in a Zoom call. So we hope that you guys will click that after the sermon and continue to hang out in fellowship with us. So today, as many of you know, it is the start of Holy Week, Palm Sunday. It, gospels record much of what happened during this really special week in the life of Jesus. And it started with Jesus's triumphant entry into Jerusalem, what we call Palm Sunday today. And we walk through his willing walk to the cross and crucifixion on Good Friday. Of course, we will get to Resurrection Sunday, but we're gonna wait for that until next week. As we've been approaching this Holy Week, we've been pausing to ask the question that the people of God must have been asking as they watched Jesus with hope and expectation that he might just be the Messiah King that they were waiting for. But it looked a lot different than what they had anticipated. So the question we've been asking is this, what Messiah is this? We talked about Jesus as a Messiah willing to suffer if that's what was needed on the path to redemption for all of humanity. A Messiah willing to suffer. We talked about Jesus' actions as the ultimate demonstration of God's love, a Messiah of love, that Christ would take on sin and curse and become the antithesis of himself in order to do a reconciling work that only God's self could do. And today we're going to talk about the extraordinary demonstration of faith that we see in Jesus crucified. So in order to do this, I want to compare two moments that bookend our Holy Week the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem compared to that anguished cry of Jesus on the cross as he experiences abandonment from God. So let's dive in. First, the triumphant entry, and we're going to read from Mark 11, 7 through 10. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it, and he sat on it. Many in the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others spread leafy branches they had cut in the fields. Jesus was in the center of the procession and the people all around him were shouting, praise God, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord, blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David, praise God in the highest heaven. We see here a kingly entrance into the holy city of Jerusalem. Remember that this is during Holy Week when the people of God were celebrating Passover, the celebration of when God had rescued God's people in the Exodus so many generations before. Many people would pilgrimage into Jerusalem in this holy time. So there was a sense of expectation already. But then we see specific signs in this moment. First, the cult. There's a prophecy in Zechariah 9.9 9 that says, Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. It wasn't that Jesus needed a ride or needed a break from walking. There's nowhere else recorded that Jesus needed to ride an animal. This was a clear sign pointing back to a fulfillment of a prophecy of a king entering, but in a way that also is humble and peaceful. The spreading of the cloaks in the Old Testament, that was a sign of the people of political allegiance to a ruler. And the branches, in Leviticus, we see the spreading of branches as being a sign of celebration in, in a festival kind of a way. And then, of course, the cries of the people and what it is that they're saying. They're pointing back to God's promise to David that a future king would come from that line and rule over God's people forever. So we see in this little moment signposts of promises that the people were waiting for, they were longing for, king, a king from the line of David to take back the throne, their Messiah expectations. And we see in this moment beautiful faith. The people were holding hope in the waiting for the promises of God to be fulfilled, and they had been waiting a long time through failed kings, through having to move into exile, currently under Roman rule in their own holy city, centuries of waiting. And this moment is a beautiful demonstration of faith that God's promises would still come to pass. They're waiting for a king in the line of David to come and take over the city and come break the Roman rule. But what they got was a Messiah king who would willingly take on sin and curse and walk to the cross. What? What Messiah is this? 
Here's where we compare the triumphant entry to the cry of Jesus from the cross. In Mark 15, 34, Jameson read this last week in a fuller version, so I'm just going to grab two verses here. Then at three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthaniya, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Verse 37, then Jesus uttered another loud cry and breathed his last. What? How can this be? In this dark moment of Jesus crying out, we witness the Messiah of extraordinary faith. Let me explain. Remember, the people were clinging to the promises of God, laying palm branches in faith that their Messiah was going to come because God had promised it. Jesus is a demonstration here of ultimate faith in the promises and the character of God. Remember, the Son of God has been with God since eternity past. In John 17, 5, Jesus says the Father and Son shared glory from before the world began. We see it there even before creation. God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a God of three persons. The Greeks used this beautiful word, perichoresis, to talk about the nature of the relationship of these three persons of God. Perichoresis means it was a self-giving love dance between Father, Son, and Spirit. It's a beautiful concept to articulate the nature of God, a God of relationship. They created not out of need. God created not out of need or because of any lack. God created out of an overflow of that self-giving love that reflects the character of God, self-giving love. And out of this character, we see God continuously pursuing ways to reconcile relationship which had broken with humanity. Systems of sacrifice and atonement in the Old Testament, priests as intermediaries, and then of course through Jesus, the ultimate self-giving love demonstrated through God's Son. We know that in Jesus, he who knew no sin became the offering for our sin, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. So here, Jesus enters Jerusalem in faith, walks through all of Holy Week in faith, prays in the garden that there could be another way, yet stands back up from his knees and continues on in faith. And in this moment, this moment of this cry from the cross, for the first time in all of history past, it shows that Jesus experiences an abyss of separation with the relationship with God. And he steps into that darkness. What do I mean he willingly steps into that darkness? Yes, all the path to the cross was Jesus moving willingly, and that includes his death, crucifixion, Crucifixion usually took much longer with victims slipping into a coma before dying. But we know that Jesus shouted out again and then released his spirit. That's how Matthew tells it in 2750. Jesus was fully conscious to the end. His death came voluntarily and suddenly. He experienced the separation. He felt that relationship separation and then willingly, voluntarily stepped into that dark abyss, and that was the step of faith. Here's what struck me as I considered that anguished cry from the cross in a, as a demonstration of faith. Sometimes the experience of faith gets to be warm and fuzzy and feel wonderful, and I do love it when that happens, but sometimes, truth be told, the most striking expression of faith is, to, is an action to move forward when the experience isn't happening, when the presence of God feels utterly lacking. Now, this moment of Jesus on the cross is utterly different than anything that we've experienced, even when we can't seem to experience God, because it was in a way beyond anything we can grasp. God's self experienced a true separation between father and son due to human sin and curse coming upon Jesus when Jesus had to become the antithesis of all that he was. And he willingly took that on because it took the breaking of the eternal love dance in order to have this reconciling work be able to happen. But in the moment that he tastes that abandonment and cries out in agony at the experience of it, Jesus chooses to still walk into the abyss, walk into a separation in faith that the God of all love and power with whom he had been united since eternity past would come through. 
And in that moment of perichoresis, relationship severed, it's the most stunning and ultimate demonstration of self-giving love of all time. Hebrews 11.1 1 explains faith this way. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Jesus knew the character of God. Jesus knew the promises of God. He knew the ongoing work of God towards reconciliation with broken humanity ever since Shalom was broken in the garden. And Jesus knew that God's plans would come to pass even if the experience of walking through it is awful and dark and lonely. Remember, this moment was a one-time event. It only could be accomplished by the Son of God because now through Jesus, we're reconciled with God and do not need to face an abyss of separation. Even when we do face moments where we can't sense the presence of God, we are not separated from God because of Christ Jesus. But here's one thing that I wanna point out as we close. When Jesus experiences this most extreme separation with God, his response is to cry out to God. It's as if he's saying, you're gone. And my response is to cry out to you about it, to cry out to you about the loss of you, because I know in faith that you are God. You are always God. Regardless of my experience, you are God for all time, even dark times. When promises still unfulfilled seem extra heavy, when hope deferred is making the heart sick, Proverbs 13, 12. So this Holy Week, as we follow the path of Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, the one who has laid the path before us and made a way to the Father through the faithfulness of the Son, I pray that you will see that this faith is something that has perfected a path for us. And when we are in an experience of darkness and can't feel the presence of God, that we would mimic and follow what Jesus did and cry to God in faith, moving forward towards God in action, regardless of what our senses say. Praise be to God that Jesus has made this path for us. And... Join us next Sunday because the fulfillment of the promises of God are indeed worth celebrating. So I'm going to pray over our time. And then once again, there will be a link to join a Zoom call so you can join in and it will be great to see one another's faces in that time. So let us pray over us while we close this moment. Father God, I pray that you would give us endurance to believe your promises and to know your character is true. Holy Spirit, give us endurance to walk in faith even when our experience does not match up what we long to see or with the redemption that we're still longing for and that our world is groaning for. Thank you, Jesus, for the love you demonstrated on the path you made for us to reconcile us with God. We pray that we would go from this place ready to engage in Holy Week by following the example of Jesus who was willing to suffer ready to demonstrate profound love of God and to move every step in faith for the promises of God that are yet to be fulfilled. If you'd open your hands in benediction, let me pray over you. May God bless you and keep you. May God cause God's face to shine upon you and may you walk into this week in faith that God's story is still being written and you get to be a glorious part of it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Go in peace.